You watch this opening cutscene, and you just have to go, how did we get here? How did this happen? Why is this happening? What on earth were they thinking when making this game? But really, to me, it's not that hard to understand how this game came to be. Firstly, as I talked about at the end of my SA2 story video, that game kind of paved the way for this game to come into existence. That game already introduced the Sonic series to the possibility of going in a slightly darker and more serious direction. This game just takes that and pushes it even further. Which is so weird, considering that the previous Sonic game kind of was walking those things back and making something more approachable to, you know, newcomers to the Sonic series, since that was the first multi-platform Sonic game. But for the very next game, they were just like, alright, forget that, we're going right back to the crazy, big, complicated stories that we were doing in the adventure games. And of course, there's also the edginess of this game to talk about, which really is a product of the time, because around this time in gaming, GTA 3 was the biggest deal ever. That game literally changed the games industry massively for so many different developers and publishers. Suddenly, overnight, everyone went from wanting to make colorful, cartoony, kid-friendly games to now we have to make dark, mature, quote-unquote, violent, gritty games to appeal to our demographic of kids that think that violence and shit like that is cool. Like, Sonic is not the only series that took on this darker direction. Like, you look at the Jack and Daxter games, and Jack 2 does the literal exact same thing that this game does, but everybody loved it. Meanwhile, you look at something like Wind Waker from around this time, and that game got lambasted for being very kiddy because of its cartoony and bright tone. It was just the trend at the time, everybody was trying to get all dark and edgy and violent, and... Some series, where the creators are smart enough to realize that that's a bad idea, are able to sidestep trends like this and just stay the course and keep on doing what works. But unfortunately, the director and lead designer of all of these 3D Sonic games, as well as the current head of Sonic Team and the writer of this game, Takashi Izuka, is not a smart enough person to realize that trying to do this with Sonic is a terrible and stupid idea. And as it turns out, trend chasing is going to be a problem that we are going to run into multiple times going forward with the Sonic series. That said, this game really isn't as edgy as a lot of people make it out to be, or even as edgy as it wants you to think it is. This opening sequence and the fact that there are gunshots on the fucking menus are really the only instances of the game trying to be super, like, try-hard, look at how cool and violent and dark we are. Like, yeah, you can use guns in the gameplay, but that's not really that egregious. I mean, there were guns in the mech stages of Sonic Adventure 2, and Gamma used one in SA1. Tails had guns on the Tornado. Like, guns have existed in the Sonic series, even from the very beginning. Some of Eggman's robots in Sonic 1 shoot guns. It's not necessarily the existence or use of guns that's the problem, it's how the game tries to present itself as, Look, we're using guns! Oh, isn't that so fucking cool? And it's really not. But when you actually start playing the game, that's really not so much of a thing. You can use guns in the gameplay, but in the cutscenes, Shadow never uses guns at all. And in general, the overall tone of the story, while darker than any previous Sonic games, it's not that much more than what was in SA2. And at this point, I'm sure some of you are gonna go, Ah, but the swearing! And the thing about the swearing in Shadow the Hedgehog, there's a couple of things about that. First of all, in Japanese, swearing is very different than it is in English. It doesn't have the same connotation socially and culturally that it does for us. It's not at all uncommon to hear characters say things like shit in children's media. In fact, Sonic says it fairly regularly in the series. But more critically, a lot of this game's juvenile overuse of swearing is entirely the product of the dub. This game was very poorly dubbed, with a lot of liberties taken with a lot of the stuff that has significantly changed multiple things in the story. And pretty much all of the most egregious lines in the game that people point to as why this game is so stupid are really not that bad at all in Japanese. Yotsume 
この僕の前にカオスエメラルドをさらけ出すとはな However, while I don't think this game is as bad as people often make it out to be as far as the edginess and the dark tone, clearly there is no denying that this game is a very far departure from what the Sonic series originally was. To the point where I honestly, in my opinion, cannot even consider this the same canon anymore. I mean, the things that happen in this game, there is just no way for me to believe that this game exists in the same universe that something like Little Planet or Angel Island exist. There is just such a vast tonal dissonance that it makes it impossible for me to think of this as one coherent universe anymore. And this is something I've talked about in the adventure games, that they do things that you wouldn't really think are appropriate for Sonic, and this game just pushes that even further, where we are now doing things that... Like, if you told someone that this was the sequel to Sonic 3 and Knuckles, they'd be like, What the fuck are you talking about? This is nothing like those games. But because of the Sonic Adventure games slowly changing the series over time, this doesn't seem like that insane of a jump compared to previous games. But compared to the original games, this is a totally different universe as far as I'm concerned. And by extension, Heroes also kind of ends up being that way because it directly leads into this game with Shadow's Amnesia. So honestly, the way I see it, the original Sonic universe and canon basically ends with SA2, and we have basically started an entirely new continuity with this game that has similarities to the old continuity, but also has significant differences that make it impossible to be the same series anymore. Some people might disagree with me on that kind of thing and see this as just one series that just went off the rails, but as far as I'm concerned, this is beyond off the rails. We have it separated entirely from the track and have gotten on a new track that is going to a different destination. And you know what? I almost kind of prefer that because now I can completely separate the original vision of Sonic from all the other crap that happens in the series that's fucking stupid. Now I can just look at this as its own thing, completely detached from the Sonic that I fell in love with in the first place, because that Sonic is fucking dead. And with this video, I'm really gonna have my work cut out for me, because I actually don't think this game's story is as bad as everybody says it is. There are some pretty decent things going on in Shadow the Hedgehog, in my opinion, and I'm gonna have to try to convince you of that. The story starts with Shadow still suffering from his amnesia from Sonic Heroes. Apparently, even after the adventure, Rouge still never explained to Shadow what his past is. All Shadow has to go on are some broken memories of the raid on the Ark 50 years ago. He doesn't even know who Maria is. A newspaper floats by and introduces us to the concept of the Black Comet, which comes around to the Earth every 50 years. And as it turns out, right now it happens to be passing by the Earth. And then, out of fucking nowhere, an alien invasion starts in the nearby city. Okay, sure. Initially, Shadow pays this no mind until he gets a visit from a very out-there character for the Sonic series. Cause Satan shows up, or as he's called in this game, Black Doom. So obviously there's some stuff that we don't know what's going on exactly, and we're gonna figure it out over the course of the game. But it's a little weird how few kind of important details they don't really explicitly tell you right off the bat. They're easy enough to figure out on your own, but I'm surprised they wouldn't make it 100% clear from the very beginning of the story that the Black Comet is the thing that the alien forces arrive to the Earth in, and that Black Doom is the leader of the aliens. Not a huge deal, and they make it clear enough as you go on, but a little bit weird in my opinion. But yeah, Shadow gets the idea from Mr. Satan that, hey, the Chaos Emeralds can uh, do some pretty incredible things, Maybe if I collect the seven Chaos Emeralds, I'll be able to figure out who I am. And this is one of the things that is a little bit different in the dub, because in the dub, Shadow basically just buys into what Black Doom says, and he's like, okay, I guess if you know who I am, then I'll give you the Chaos Emeralds. 
just believing in the most evil-looking motherfucker in the universe for no reason, when that's not really how it is in Japanese. In the original version of the story, Shadow just decides he's going to collect the Chaos Emeralds because he thinks he'll figure out who he is. He's not necessarily going to give them to Black Doom, which works a lot better considering some of the ways this story plays out has you opposing Black Doom, which would make it hard for him to tell Shadow who he is. So that's just the first of the many translation errors that we're going to be running into. And from here is where we get into the difficulty of Shadow the Hedgehog's story, because unlike all the other previous Sonic games, with Shadow the Hedgehog having its mission-based game design and its branching game structure, it's not a clear-cut, simple A to B type of story. Because the story can branch out in many different directions, there's a whole lot of non-canon things that can happen in Shadow the Hedgehog because this game has all its different endings and the different choices that you can make to influence the direction that Shadow goes in. And this results in the story being kind of hard to follow on your first playthrough. Because the thing is, you're not supposed to get the full story by just doing one playthrough of Shadow the Hedgehog. You are meant to play the game multiple times and see all of the different facets of it, and then piece it all together. This results in Shadow the Hedgehog often getting criticized for being a completely fucking mess of a story that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be, because when you really look at it, the way I see it, outside of Shadow himself and what choices you make with him, there's essentially five story threads in Shadow the Hedgehog, and if you look at the level select, there's five rows of levels. And if you look at this model I put together, this kind of gives you an idea of how you can follow each of the story threads. One is assigned to each of the rows, and if you just get on that row as soon as possible, you'll be able to follow that story thread and figure it out completely without much issue. Oh wait! No, this isn't how this works at all! because the story threads are actually spread out through the levels more like this. What the fuck were they thinking with laying out the story in this kind of way? I really feel like this is a product of focusing primarily on the mission design and the structure of the game overall, and then trying to make a story within this game structure which basically becomes impossible because you can jump up and down across these different story threads willy-nilly. And this results in many, many problems. It's essentially impossible to fully understand any one story thread in a single playthrough of Shadow the Hedgehog. You're going to get early scenes from one story thread that are supposed to be setups for later scenes in that same thread that you will never see in the same playthrough. And you have the potential of following one story thread and then at the last minute changing what path you're on and then suddenly you're at the ending of a different story thread that you've not been following whatsoever. On top of that, because of all the choices in this game creating many non-canon scenarios, many of these story threads, depending on how you play through the game, directly contradict each other and cannot both exist in the same story. This means it's possible, depending on the path you take through the level, for characters to literally be saying different things level to level to level, contradicting themselves repeatedly. It also means that even if you try your hardest to follow a single story thread, it is impossible to play through the game where another irrelevant story thread does not crop up somewhere along your playthrough, and if you try to follow story threads in a way that makes sense, you can very easily get derailed because of the mission structure and be put on a different story thread unintentionally. For example, in one of the second to last levels, it takes place on Eggman's base, and you can run into Omega here, who is pursuing Eggman as he is trying to kill him in typical Omega fashion, and he asks Shadow for help. If you help Omega in this mission, you do not go on to the next mission where you get to the inside of Eggman's base, where you can then assist Omega in confronting Eggman directly. No, in order to continue this story thread, you have to actually ignore Omega so you can help him later. If you try to help him now, then the next thing that happens is Sonic randomly shows up with a spaceship and you go to the Space Colony Arc to defend it from the invading aliens. We have completely derailed from the Eggman story that we were on and shifted over to the Gun vs. Black Arms story thread, which you may have not been following for the entirety of this playthrough, so you have no idea what the fuck is even going on. 
And this is a problem that happens constantly in Shadow the Hedgehog. Some missions do connect to each other in a logical way that makes sense. But there are many missions where if you do it, you will suddenly be thrown into a random situation that has absolutely no bearing on what you were just doing at all. It's just such a poor way to lay out this story in a way that makes it easily digestible. Like, fuck, I criticize Sonic Adventure 2 for taking one story and splitting it in two halves, but this game fucking takes it and shreds it into a million pieces and then throws them all up into the air and says, figure it out. And to be fair, when you actually are playing through the game, it's not that hard to piece everything together. It's just that on your first playthroughs, there are going to be many things that don't make any sense and story threads that begin and then just get completely dropped that over time will start to get answers as you see different parts of the game. The difficulty comes in when you try to lay out all these things for a story explanation video because holy fuck, in order to get all of this straight in my head, I had to make a fucking chart for myself to figure out what all the story threads are and how they progress. But, I do think I managed to figure it all out, so for now, before we get into Shadow's involvement in the story, I'm just gonna quickly go over the five major story threads that are going on all at once in Shadow the Hedgehog, and then we'll talk about how Shadow fits into all of this. And thankfully, the first two story threads are directly intertwined with each other, that being number one, the good guys and what they're up to, meaning Sonic and Friends and Gun. And number two is the alien force invading the Earth, the Black Arms, the aliens, and these two story threads are directly intertwined with each other because it is the war that they are engaging in. The story always begins with the invasion of Westopolis and Gunn trying to defend it, and can I just say, credit where credit is due, this whole game is about this global war and this invasion by this alien force, and within the limited resources they have to use in-game, they manage to do a fairly good job of making this feel like a war, because you always have multiple factions in all the levels fighting with each other, and there's explosions and all kinds of shit. In the background, you can see destroyed cities with black arms shit all over the place. This game actually does a pretty decent job of making this global conflict actually feel like it's the scale that it's supposed to be. So that is actually decently done. By the way, one nice detail that I want to note is that during one of the arc levels, they actually have recreated some of the level design from Sonic Adventure 2 in the arc levels there, which I appreciate, because it really does make it feel like this is the same place that it was from that game. Anyway, from Westopolis, the two story threads of the good guys and bad guys kind of split, depending on Shadow's actions and how he influences things. But pretty much in all scenarios, it eventually ends up with a conflict over the Space Colony arc, where the Black Arms try to take it in order to gain control of the Eclipse Cannon, and the good guys go there to try to stop them, and depending on what happens there, it then escalates to a final conflict where one side will attack the other one's base. So that's the first two story threads, and the third story thread, I would say, is Eggman and what he's doing. Simply put, Eggman independently also decides to engage with the Black Arms, as if they have their way, he will not be able to take over the world. And he's also after the Chaos Emeralds for really no given reason at all. Like, there really should have been a thing where he says something along the lines of like, I've devised a plan how to defeat both Gun and the Black Arms, and all I need is the seven Chaos Emeralds. But there's absolutely nothing like that in the story. He's just after the Chaos Emeralds for no given reason. Whatever. Anyway, next story thread would be the Gun Commander, who is a new character introduced for this game and he has a personal vendetta against Shadow for reasons that are not exactly explained up front. And lastly, the fifth story thread would be the Chaotix, because you run into them multiple different times throughout the game, and they're up to something, but we're not entirely sure what for the majority of the story. Charmy is getting top secret data from Gun. Espio infiltrates Eggman's network to get some intel from him, and Vector is after some computer data on the Space Colony Arc, so these three are after something. What it is, well, we're gonna have to find out. 
So those, I would say, are the five major story threads going on in Shadow the Hedgehog. And the way that this game's story is handled, it kind of comes across as like this is just a big conflict with all these different things happening. Gun and the Black Arms fighting each other, Eggman also fighting the Black Arms on his own, the Chaotix doing their own thing, the Gun Commander having it out for Shadow. All of this stuff is happening, and then we follow Shadow as he gets caught in the middle of all these different story threads, and slowly figuring out all of the pieces of what's going on in all the different threads. And of course, conveniently, no matter where Shadow goes, he ends up running into Sonic's trademark friends. And this is where the whole choice thing comes in with Shadow the Hedgehog, because every mission you have the option to follow the good guys, follow the bad guys, or just go your own way. And this is where one of the other major criticisms of Shadow the Hedgehog comes in. Shadow's characterization in this game. This game, and even heroes to a certain extent, are often cited as completely misunderstanding Shadow's character and essentially murdering his characterization and turning him into the dark, brooding edgelord that everybody always stereotypes him as. But to be honest, I do not agree with that at all. This is another thing where I'm going to have my work cut out for me because I actually think this game does Shadow's characterization fairly well. And I know some people will say, how could you possibly say that this game gets Shadow right when it has scenes like this? <laughs> That's not Shadow at all. We know Shadow from Sonic Adventure 2. He was only a villain in that game because he was being manipulated by Gerald. The true Shadow is actually a pure soul, a kind person that wants to protect the world and fulfill Maria's promise. Shadow would never do something like this. But I feel like the only way you could make that kind of assertion is to completely ignore the entire premise that this game is built on, which is that Shadow has amnesia. Yes, the real Shadow, the one from Sonic Adventure 2, would never try to fucking destroy the world. Someone should really tell that to this Shadow, because he does not know that, because he does not remember that. He does not remember who he is. That's the entire point of the game. Shadow is trying to find the answer to the question, who am I? In this game, at the beginning, Shadow is a blank slate. He could be anything, and that is why the game has the choices. Depending on how you play the game, Shadow is not dark or edgy or villainous to any capacity. For example, if we look at the fully hero route, then we have Shadow working with Sonic and the other good guys to fight against the Black Arms. And it eventually leads to the good guys going to the Space Colony Arc to stop the Black Arms from getting control of the Eclipse Cannon, where Shadow regains his memories and he remembers everything that happened in SA2 and his promise to Maria. And then he teams up with all the good guys to invade the Black Comet, and he and Sonic defeat Black Doom and save the world. You could try to make the argument that this is the only story path that really makes sense for Shadow's character, because Shadow is a good guy, he is not a villain, he would not allow the Black Arms to destroy the planet. But to me, the only way you could make that argument is if you were trying to completely ignore what this game is trying to explore with Shadow's character. Because of his amnesia, I think it's perfectly believable that Shadow could end up turning onto the dark path, because people are shaped by the experiences they have in life. If Shadow does not remember any of the experiences he had that made him a hero, then it's entirely possible for him to become a villain. And if you actually look at the dark story and the way it progresses, I think it's fairly well executed and believable that Shadow would turn out the way he does. At the beginning, he's listening to Black Doom because Black Doom apparently seems to know who he is, so he's like, okay, this guy knows who I am, I'll go along with him for now. And while Shadow is following Black Doom, Black Doom is showing him visions of his past. 
But unlike on the good side of the story, when Shadow has visions of the past, he sees them as they are, and he remembers Maria, and the good that she was, and how she influenced him, and the promise he made to her. But the visions that Black Doom is showing Shadow are different. He is showing Shadow the raid on the Ark. He is showing the atrocities that humans have committed to him in the past. And while you play through the level, Black Doom is talking and trying to hammer it into Shadow's head. Remember the things the humans did to you. Remember what they took from you. Remember your hatred for them. So Shadow is being shown a skewed and altered version of his memories that is convincing him that humans are awful things that have committed atrocities and do not deserve to exist. Now where have I heard that before? Another thing I need to point out when people argue that Shadow is a good guy is that Shadow was not brainwashed in Sonic Adventure 2. Gerald just altered his memories a little bit and made him believe that Maria's wish was for him to kill everyone, and he was perfectly willing to comply with that. So the possibility is entirely within Shadow's character that he could want to kill everyone on Earth. That is the point of the game. The experiences you have can shape you. The people you spend time with can influence you one direction or another and change the course of your life. In this way, I absolutely think that Shadow the Hedgehog does a pretty decent job of being true to Shadow's character because it shows us the things that we've already seen. Shadow can be a hero, but he can also be a villain depending on what he comes to believe about himself. And in a way, this duality kind of works pretty well for Shadow, considering one of his major things as a character is his ability to manipulate Chaos Energy. And as Sonic Adventure established, Chaos Energy can turn one's thoughts into power, both their positive thoughts and their negative thoughts. And that idea is manifested by the good and bad Chaos Energy meters that Shadow has. If he embraces the positive side of his character, then he gets access to his more positive Chaos powers, but if he embraces the dark side of his character, then he gets the more destructive and violent Chaos powers. And you know, it's not at all uncommon for Sonic to take inspiration from Star Wars, and so this whole good and evil thing, giving you access to different powers, what path is Shadow going to go down, what choice is he going to make? I think this is all stuff that is generally pretty appropriate for Shadow. However, we also need to address the fact that none of these roots are actually canon, and that is another thing that a lot of people often criticize about this game, because it does this whole thing about you making choices for Shadow and guiding his path through life and what he ends up becoming as a person, and then it ends up not even mattering because none of the choices you make actually stick. But I actually don't really think this is a problem either, because I think people are looking at this in the wrong way. We're not really necessarily making choices for Shadow. Like, literally, you as the player, you do choose do you want to go down the good path or the dark path. But in the context of the actual story, I think it's more just supposed to be that we are playing out one possibility of what Shadow can become. That's really what the majority of this game's story is about. Exploring the possibilities. Shadow is a blank slate. He doesn't know who he is, and he wants to get that answer. And there are many different things he can come to believe himself to be. He can regain his memory from Sonic Adventure 2, and go back to being the hero that he chose to be at the end of that game, and go back to fulfilling Maria's promise. The thing is, that's not what happens. That's just one possibility. Depending on how things play out, Shadow can become many other things, and personally, I find many of these possibilities to be very interesting theoretical directions that they could have taken Shadow's character. For example, one of the story threads, the Gun Commander, he has his vendetta against Shadow. Why is that? Well, that's because Shadow can eventually learn that the Gun Commander was there on the Ark 50 years ago, and he saw Shadow get created by Professor Gerald, but he also saw that Gerald had some help in creating Shadow. Because remember, the Black Comet comes by the Earth every 50 years, and so as it turns out, Black Doom helped Gerald complete Shadow. And it's because of this that the government decides to shut down the Ark and the research that's going on there, and thus, Shadow's creation is what caused the raid on the Ark that killed everyone. Somehow the commander was lucky enough to avoid getting killed, 
but he was traumatized by all of his friends and family getting slaughtered in front of him, and he blames Shadow for destroying his entire life. And when he finally gets to confront Shadow to take his revenge, he learns that he was not the only person that lost everything that day. <laughs> お前の言うことが真実であるのなら僕は謹んで罪を償う。本当に覚えていないのか。しかし今は時間をくれ。僕に真実を探す時間を。And so Shadow goes to confront Black Doom and confirm if he truly was made by Black Doom in cooperation with Gerald, to which Black Doom confirms that yes, Shadow was partially created by Black Doom, and so his creation is what is responsible for all of the deaths aboard the Ark. And so Shadow comes to the conclusion that the only thing he can do to atone for his existence is defeating Black Doom and then ending his own life as his very existence is a sin. Alternatively, if Shadow does not confront Black Doom, then he will instead run into Eggman, and he defeats Eggman, and without hearing it directly from Black Doom, he can't be 100% certain of what happened here long ago, but he does come to the conclusion that the Ark is his home, and he comes to cherish it as a place that was once very dear to him, and so he essentially banishes Eggman and everyone from ever setting foot on the Ark, and exiling himself to be alone on the Ark forever as its guardian. And I think that is a pretty cool idea of what to do with Shadow's character. Again, it's not what gets done with his character, but it's just one possibility, and it's one that I think is a pretty neat idea. Meanwhile, in another possibility, Let's say that Shadow goes after Eggman, because Shadow was found in Eggman's base, so clearly Eggman must know what happened to Shadow after the events of Sonic Adventure 2, so Shadow goes after Eggman to find answers. And what he finds is the Shadow androids that were first introduced in Sonic Heroes. And that game introduced the possibility that we don't know whether or not this Shadow is the same Shadow from Sonic Adventure 2, or if it's just another one of Eggman's copies. And following along this thread, Eggman manages to convince Shadow that, yes, he is just another one of Eggman's robots that he created. Whether or not that's actually true essentially it does not matter. If Shadow comes to believe it, then it ends up being true for his character. And by the way, can we just stop here? Because I have just one side comment to make, looking at Shadow next to the Shadow androids. Why is Shadow brown in this game? You can clearly see that the Shadow androids are black, and Shadow is clearly brown. What the fuck happened with the textures on Shadow? How did they get the main playable character of the game the wrong color in his own fucking video game? In all the pre-rendered cutscenes, he's black as he's supposed to be. Why the fuck did they make Shadow brown? What happened? Can someone please make a mod for this game that just replaces Shadow's textures and makes him black? Because it drives me up the fucking wall. Why is Shadow brown? Anyway, back to the Eggman story. So Shadow comes to believe that he is in fact just a copy of the Shadow from SA2 who died, but that doesn't mean that he's just going to become subservient to Eggman. No, this actually goes in a very different direction than that. He ends up hunting down Eggman all the way to his base, where he defeats him, and in one version he accepts that he's a copy of the original Shadow, but that he is going to surpass the original. Or in the other version, which is my preferred one, him and Omega team up to finally complete Omega's objective of fucking killing Eggman, and the two of them plan to take over Eggman's robot empire and take over the world in the name of robots. What the fuck? Like, this is totally out there and completely weird. But again, I think this is a fairly interesting direction. It's almost kind of similar to Metal Sonic in Sonic Heroes, an Eggman robot rebelling against him and then wanting to take over the world in the name of machines. A little goofy, but I think it's kind of cool. Though I do have to say, some of these fucking endings are absolutely fucking ridiculous and stupid. Like, for example, if you go all the way to the hero story, and then at the very last moment you turn evil, then it's like, okay, what's supposed to be the story justification here? Why was Shadow helping out the good guys all the way to this point, and then at the last minute he betrays them? 
And the reason for it is simply that he just is fed up with Sonic and wants to kill him, which I find really funny. Like, Shadow just has gotten annoyed with Sonic. Because if you play the hero story, you run into Sonic multiple times, and Sonic acts, like, particularly obnoxious in this game, which I think was done intentionally to justify this ending, where Shadow is being a good guy and he's teaming up with Sonic, but in doing so, he spends so much time with Sonic that he gets fucking irritated with him, and he's like, Oh my god, I can't fucking stand you anymore. I am literally going to kill you because you're so fucking annoying. And that is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard of in my life, and it is hilarious. So I am all for stupid, goofy endings in this game as well. And they also kind of turn it into a thing of, like, Shadow trying to surpass Sonic, as, you know, SA2. Sonic is really the ultimate life form, not Shadow, so this is kind of a way to get back at him in that way. That kind of works as well, but I kind of prefer the goofier, I just think you're annoying. And as far as the two main story threads, Gun versus the Black Arms, the direction that that story thread ends up going depends on who Shadow ends up siding with. If he sides with the good guys in Gun, then they start beating back the Black Arms and they're forced to retreat. Gun pursues them, they end up defeating them at the Ark, and they move on to defeat them at the Black Comet, saving the world. Whereas if Shadow sides with the Black Arms, then the Black Arms start managing to push further and further into human territory. They completely take over and destroy Westopolis, and then they go for Central City, which is kind of like the capital in the universe of Sonic. It's where Sonic Adventure 2 took place, so it's where the president is, and so they're going after the president. This forces him to have to retreat to a safety bunker, where the Black Arms eventually storm that as well, and go after the president in order to take out Gun and take over the world. And Shadow can either be subservient to Black Doom and help him accomplish this, or betray Black Doom and just say, fuck it, I'm gonna destroy the entire planet and kill fucking everyone. Essentially fulfilling Gerald's goal in Sonic Adventure 2. Shadow, Again, an interesting direction, I think, to take with Shadow's character, that he ends up going on the downfall that Gerald tried to make him go on in Sonic Adventure 2. It ends up happening anyway, and he does destroy the Earth. Again, I find all of these to be interesting explorations of the possible things that Shadow could become. And depending on how well it's going for the Black Arms, it's possible that they do get control of the Ark, and instead of just surrounding the White House and forcing the President to flee, they fucking shoot the Eclipse Cannon at the fucking White House, and... Holy fucking shit, look at this! Remember what I said about SA1 out of nowhere having a ridiculously high body count all of a sudden? Jesus Christ, this game takes that to the next fucking level, doesn't it? Well, actually, no, because in the very next scene, they totally push out, and it turns out that the president managed to escape, and all of the people of Central City were evacuated. Like, are you fucking kidding me? First of all, that's not just Central City that got destroyed. Half of the fucking country got fucking annihilated in that. There is no way you're gonna do the, well, we didn't see anybody die, so everyone's okay. Like, come on, dude. I thought this game was supposed to be fucking edgy. This isn't edgy, this game is totally fucking toothless. Cowards. Cowards, I say. How could they not commit to killing tens of millions of people in this kid's Sonic the Hedgehog video game? For shame. And also, can we go back a little bit? So the Black Arms manage to get control of the Space Colony arc and they fire the Eclipse Cannon at Earth, right? How exactly did they do that? Because I don't know if you remember the game that this game takes a lot of its story elements from, called Sonic Adventure 2, but at the end of that game, the Eclipse Cannon is destroyed. So, how is it working in this game? And for that matter, while we're talking about things from Sonic Adventure 2 that get blown up, one of the levels in this game also takes place on Prison Island. You remember what happened to Prison Island in Sonic Adventure 2? And there's another one as well. You remember the moon in Sonic Adventure 2 and how half of it gets fucking blown up? Well, there it is. Intact, like nothing ever happened. 
what is going on with all these inconsistencies? Is there an explanation for these things? Actually, yes, there is. The reason all these things are back to normal is because Sonic Team just doesn't give a fuck. I have gotten many comments on my previous Sonic Story videos, especially Sonic Adventure 2, where when I point out things that don't make sense, plot holes and logical errors that are not properly explained in the game, I've got many comments explaining that there are ways that these things can make sense and they can work, and that I'm making assumptions and that's why these things don't make sense. For example, I called Eggman a hypocrite in Sonic Adventure 2 for wanting to stop Gerald from destroying the world, when five minutes earlier he was going to do the exact same thing by firing the Eclipse Cannon at the Earth and destroying it. Some people have pointed out that I am assuming that the Eclipse Cannon always must be fired at full power. It's entirely possible that Eggman's only gonna fire at the Earth with like 20% power just to destroy that country and show he means business. And you know what? That is entirely possible and does fix that problem. Except that it doesn't. Because the real problem here is that we don't know one way or the other what's happening because it's not explained to us. This is, in my opinion, the biggest issue that the Sonic series has from a writing, lore, and world-building perspective. There are so many things that are just not explained properly. Was Eggman going to fire at the Earth with 20% power or full power? We don't know, the game doesn't tell us, which means we have to make assumptions. Same thing for Rouge not telling Shadow about his past in Sonic Heroes. I said it might be because she wants to manipulate Shadow in order to achieve her own goals. Other people have suggested that she's not 100% sure whether or not this is the same Shadow that she knew during the events of Sonic Adventure 2, so she doesn't want to tell him. Very possible, but that's not the issue. When I was pointing out all of these things that don't make sense and don't have explanations, I was not trying to assert my assumptions as correct and thus the story does not make sense. I was trying to point out that because there are no explanations here, there is no reason and so we have to make up what's going on ourselves. And inevitably what's going to happen is people are going to come to different assumptions and there are going to be things that contradict each other. And this is a problem that has existed in the Sonic series from the very beginning. Like in the classic games, we have the whole issue of the Chaos Emeralds being from all these different islands, and you're just like, what's going on here? Some people have theorized that in the original version of the Sonic lore, there may have actually been more than seven Chaos Emeralds, and so all the different Chaos Emeralds that we find on all the different islands in those games are all different sets of Chaos Emeralds found on those islands. That pretty much explains that weird continuity error, but the problem is they never explicitly state that that is the case. In all of those old manuals, there's never a single instance where there's something said like, Chaos Emeralds can be found all over the world. They never say something like that. They only ever say that you can find the Chaos Emeralds here, without ever acknowledging that this is just one set of Chaos Emeralds. And so it's like, it could be that there are more than seven Chaos Emeralds, or it could just be that they don't give a fuck and they're just retconning it or not paying attention to the continuity because they don't care. And personally, I find that to be a more believable explanation than the multiple Chaos Emeralds theory. And in the instance of Eggman firing the Eclipse Cannon at Earth, I assume he was going to fire it at full power, because earlier in the story they established that the Eclipse Cannon is capable of destroying an entire planet. Why would you even mention that if it wasn't going to become relevant to the story? Because there are so many plot holes in these games, I do not make all of my assumptions in favor of the story working. I am going to make the most logical and natural assumption based on how these games are written, and most of the time, that is incredibly carelessly. So in Shadow the Hedgehog, why is the Eclipse Cannon no longer destroyed? You can just make a guess that, oh, well, maybe Gunn repaired it because they wanted to have it available for a defense system in case of an emergency, whatever. You can make up any crap, but the actual explanation is that there is no explanation. It's just back to normal. Shut up. Don't think about it. Why is Prison Island back to normal? Oh, well, they rebuilt their bit. No, there is no reason. It just is. Why is the moon back to normal? Ah, this one we actually do have an official explanation for. Not in the game, of course, that would be ridiculous. No, in an interview with Takashi Izuka, he explained that the moon turned, and so now the hole in it just no longer can be seen from the Earth. 
And that is the fucking dumbest thing I have ever heard in my life, and I do not buy that for a second. I am not gonna let them get away with lazy fucking writing like that. No, the moon did not fucking turn, and that's why it's back to normal. The real reason the moon is back to normal is because they were like, well, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have a giant hole in the moon for the rest of the Sonic series? Obviously not. So how do we address that? How do we get the moon back to normal? Eh, fuck it, we'll just ignore that. The moon's just back to normal, shut up, don't think about it. And so, as far as I'm concerned, that is the explanation. There is none, they just don't give a fuck. It's just back to normal. This carelessness and the amount of details that they just do not fucking explain these Sonic games drives me up the fucking wall because it would not even be difficult to explain these things. All you would need is one line of dialogue to explain a lot of these things and fix these problems, but they can't even be bothered to do that because they straight up do not give a fuck. As far as I'm concerned, at a certain point in the Sonic series, there is no longer such a thing as continuity. There is no more canon in the Sonic series, if you ask me, because they will just pick and choose what things get carried over into future games and what things don't. And I think that is fine in the context of the classic games that barely have any story at all. But once you get to these Sonic Adventure style games that have all this story focused and that are trying to expand the lore and the world building of the series, the lack of consistency across so many fucking things is a major problem, in my opinion. It is the reason that, to this day, we still don't even know what the fuck the world of Sonic the Hedgehog looks like. The geography of the planet changes game to game, and, like, you look at this game, and it looks like a relatively realistic and believable world. Does South Island still exist in this game? Does West Side Island? Does the Little Planet still exist? What about Sonic Heroes? Grand Metropolis is like a science fiction futuristic city. What's going on there? How can that exist at the same time as contemporary cities like what we see in the adventure games? No explanation for it. Shut up, don't think about it. That's the answer, because world building does not exist in this franchise. I mean, fuck, they can't even be consistent about whether or not humans exist in the Sonic games. It changes game to game. This has caused a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration recently in the Sonic community. Because you look at one Sonic game, and there will be humans all over the place, and then in the next Sonic game, it's a world populated entirely with animal characters, and it's like humans don't even exist. And we're just like, what the fuck is going on? And when asked about this, they just made up some crap on the spot where they're like, Oh, well, actually, there's two worlds in Sonic, one for humans and one for animals. And everybody hated that explanation because there's never been anything in the series to ever hint that that's the case. And just recently, they ran that back and instead said that it is a world populated by humans and animals. But the very fact that they can run something like that back shows that they did not have an established explanation for this that they were creating all these games under. You can try to tell me that there's two worlds, or that humans and animals just live in different parts of the world, but I'm not a fucking idiot. I know that the real reason is because Sonic Team just does not care, and they do whatever they want, game to game. And here's the thing. That would be perfectly fine. I'd be fine if every game basically took place in its own pocket universe and was completely unrelated to every other Sonic game. But the fact of the matter is, they still do try to act like there is continuity. This game follows up all of the previous games that have come before. It has many direct references to Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Heroes, while at the same time directly contradicting them. And again, this is something that will continue to happen repeatedly throughout the Sonic series, where I just go, is there a continuity or is there not? I don't fucking know, dude. I don't fucking care at this point. This series becomes a fucking disaster going forward. Because they do this wishy-washy thing where they can't decide whether or not they want to have a continuing story that builds off of previous games, or something more like Mario where every game is essentially a one-off. Pick one or the other and stick to that. The fact that they are so inconsistent with this stuff drives me absolutely insane. And this is not me ragging on Shadow the Hedgehog specifically, because this is not a problem exclusive to this game. It is a problem with almost every Sonic game, and this game was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Huh. <sighs> okay, sorry for that rant, but I just had to get that out of my system at this point, because going forward, this same exact thing is gonna keep happening, and I'm gonna keep pointing it out. 
I am not going to excuse sloppy, shitty writing when they're trying to act like this series does have continuity. So, now that that's over, let's get back to talking about the story of Shadow the Hedgehog. To get us back on track, I was talking about how, while none of these different roots of the game are canon, I still think that they are valuable to the way that this game story is told, because it is about exploring the possibilities, and most importantly, we are exploring through all of these different endings what Shadow does not become. That's why they make you play through all of these endings before you get access to the actual canon last story. Shadow is trying to figure out who he is. He's looking for answers. Who is he? Well, he is not the Guardian of the Ark that exiles himself forever. He is not the Pawn of Black Doom that hands him the planet on a silver platter. He is not a Shadow Android that tries to overthrow Eggman and take over the world. And contrary to popular belief, he is not even the Shadow that regains his memories and saves the world to fulfill Maria's promise. So, if Shadow isn't any of those things, then who is he? Well, that's what we get to see in the last story. Starting the last story, it just begins with Shadow having collected the seven Chaos Emeralds, and we don't know how he got them. Some people like to try to look at all the different routes and figure out what is the one that's most likely to be the canon route that leads directly into the last story, but the entire point is that none of them do. Shadow went through some path of some kind to get to the Seven Chaos Emeralds, and now he is going to get his real answer of who he is. How did Shadow get on the Black Comet to be here? Shut up, don't think about it. And this is when Black Doom shows up and thanks Shadow for getting the Seven Chaos Emeralds for him, as was promised, apparently. And then Sonic and his friends TM show up and are like, Shadow, you can't give him the Chaos Emeralds because he's going to try to destroy the planet. However, earlier in the story, we can hear from Black Doom that he's not actually here to destroy the Earth. He's here to save it. And you're like, huh? What's that all about? And now Black Doom does that villain thing where he just, for no reason, explains his plan to all the good guys, and they all just stand around and listen to him when they could all just be attacking him right now. <laughs> A fairly generic villain motivation, but I actually do kind of like it because it ties in with Gerald's motivation in Sonic Adventure 2, the idea that humanity is awful and they're going to lead to their own destruction. Gerald thought humanity was awful and so he wanted to kill them all, but Black Doom believes he can quote-unquote save humanity from itself by subjugating the entirety of humanity under the Black Arms rule. Sure, that works well enough, why not? Of course, Shadow doesn't want to go along with this plan, but Black Doom just takes the Chaos Emeralds from him and uses all seven of them to do Chaos Control, warping the Black Comet down to the surface of the Earth. Now that the Black Arms have a proper foothold on the planet, they can easily take over. However, of course, Sonic and Friends TM are not going to allow that to happen, except for one problem. The Black Comet naturally emits a gas that, when mixed with Earth's atmosphere, creates a neurotoxin that paralyzes creatures from Earth. Which is extremely convenient for the Black Arms, and very specific, because in some of the levels, the good guys go to the Black Comet and they're totally fine, so whatever atmosphere the Black Comet has on normally doesn't affect Earth creatures, but specifically when it mixes with the Earth's atmosphere, that's when it starts paralyzing things. Okay, sure, I guess we can go along with it. I mean, really, it's just to make it so that no one can do anything, and so only Shadow is the one that can save the day, because as we learn in some of the stories, Shadow is part Black Arms, thus he is able to resist the Neurotoxin. Which, by the way, paralysis doesn't work like this. You don't get, like, frozen like a statue. I mean, look at Tails. He's, like, balancing on one foot. How the fuck is he doing that? Whatever, it's not really a big deal. It's just a goofy thing I wanted to point out. However, it's not just Shadow's Black Arms DNA that allows him to overcome the Neurotoxin. It is also because this is the moment where Shadow finds out who he really is.
僕の名はシャドウ・ザ・ヘッジホック一切の過去を捨てた男誰のためでもなく何にとらわれるでもない自らの意志で目障りな貴様を消す We'll talk about this in more detail in a little bit but right now I have to point out that I feel like these two cutscenes here were originally in the script one cutscene that was just split in two to insert the final level because we basically go through the same thing twice here. Shadow breaks free from his paralysis, and then Black Doom retreats to a different part of the Black Comet. You play the final level to catch up to him, and then Black Doom paralyzes Shadow again, and then he breaks free from the paralysis again. Just a guess on my part, because it really seems pointless to do this same thing twice. But essentially, the gist of it is that Shadow goes to confront Black Doom, and he's doing the whole, Oh, this is for the good of humanity, I want to take over and I'm evil, and Shadow's like, Shut the fuck up, I'm not listening to your bullshit. But then, Black Doom reveals that because Shadow has Black Arm's DNA inside him, he can mind control him, although it's not really mind control, it's just like physical body control, and he pins Shadow down in place. While Shadow is unable to move like this, we cut over to the Space Colony arc to finally get the payoff on the chaotic story thread. What is it that they've been doing this whole time, collecting all this data? What have they been working towards? Well, it was to get access to a recording from Gerald Robotnik from 50 years ago. Not the one where he condemns humanity to die, a different recording from 50 years ago. <laughs> この研究所は政府の手によって封鎖されるであろう。研究資料はもちろん、わしや研究所の仲間たちも幽閉されてしまう矢も知れん。わしが犯してしまった過ちによって、あの彗星の悪魔と接触してしまったばかりにジェラル
he was not able to make it come together. The project was just not working out. And Maria's health was probably deteriorating and getting worse and worse, and so he started to become desperate that he absolutely needed to finish Project Shadow as quickly as possible to save Maria. And that is when the Black Comet shows up and Gerald makes contact with the Black Arms, and Black Doom offers to help Gerald finish the project in exchange for Shadow giving him the Seven Chaos Emeralds next time they pass around the Earth. Gerald agrees to this deal out of desperation, but of course he has no intention of holding up his end of the bargain, so he creates the Eclipse Cannon to destroy the Black Comet when it comes back around. However, his dealings with the Black Arms are discovered, and the fact that he sold out all of humanity to complete his research, and that is why the government chooses to shut down the Ark and kill everyone aboard. By extension, it is essentially Gerald's fault that Maria dies because he made the deal with Black Doom. A lot of people say that Black Doom is a stupid character because he's such an over-designed, like, oh, I'm a bad guy, and his motivation is very simple, just a bad guy thing. But I actually think that the character kind of works in relation to how it expands Gerald, because Gerald literally made a deal with the devil. He was desperate to save Maria, and so he resorted to selling out all of humanity and allying with something of pure evil. And the very fact that he would resort to dealing with that evil ultimately becomes his downfall. It adds an extra layer to Gerald that was not there before that I think works really well, actually. Though it does kind of undermine one of the themes of Sonic Adventure 2 a little bit, because in that game, the death of Maria is treated as a sin committed by humanity, but now this game is kind of portraying that as Gerald's sin, so in a way it kind of turns into, like, Gerald deflecting the blame from himself to humanity, kind of muddling what SA2 was going for. But in terms of what this game is going for, I think it's a pretty cool idea, actually. And also another detail I just want to point out is Shadow's appearance, you know, black with the red stripes. This game essentially retcons the reason he looks like that to be because of his Black Arms DNA, because if you look at the Black Arms creatures, they are dark and they have those red patterns on them, and so Shadow being a mimic of Sonic with Black Arms DNA, he ends up looking the way he does. Kind of a cool idea, makes you think that if Shadow was able to be completed without the Black Arms, he would look a lot more like Sonic, like he was originally intended to. Kind of cool. Also, the fact that Black Doom can do Chaos Control makes me think that that might be the thing that Gerald needed the Black Arms DNA for in the first place. He could not figure out how to make a creature that could manipulate the power of the Chaos Emeralds, but Black Arms can do that, so he needed Black Arms DNA. Not that I'm saying I think Sonic is a Black Arms or anything like that, just, you know, Sonic, for whatever reason, he's just special and he can Chaos Control. And in order to recreate that effect artificially, Gerald had to resort to some extraterrestrial means. And now we need to talk about Shadow and his arc in this game, because a lot of people criticize Shadow the Hedgehog for, with the whole amnesia thing, they basically just do Shadow's arc from SA2 again, but worse. And I do not agree with that at all. In fact, to me, it seems like most people either misunderstand what's going on at the end of this game, or are actively ignoring it because I guess they don't like what they did with Shadow. But I actually really like what they did with Shadow's character in the ending of this game. To quickly go through things, Shadow attacks Black Doom, who then teleports away, leaving Shadow with the seven Chaos Emeralds. He uses them to go Super Shadow. Shadow and Black Doom fight, he ends up defeating him, and then Shadow uses Chaos Control to teleport the Black Comet in front of the Ark, which he then fires the Eclipse Cannon at it and destroys the Black Comet. How the Eclipse Cannon is functional, don't worry about it. Oh, and by the way, during the boss fight with Black Doom, Sonic and Friends TM explain that they managed to escape from the Black Comet, so it's totally fine to go all out and destroy it. And with that, the world is saved, and everybody celebrates, and we get a nice scene cutting back to the President and the Gun Commander completing his arc in this game. はい。もちろんですか、か。
This is one of those things that was completely mistranslated in the English dub, where they say that they're going to honor Gerald for what he did. What did no, 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 that's all wrong. That doesn't even make any sense. The last fucking thing that Gerald did in his life was try to kill everybody. No, this scene is actually them saying that in honor of Shadow, who, despite everything that humanity has put him through, he's the one who has suffered the most, and yet he is the one that has chosen to save everyone, and so they want to follow Shadow's example and build a better future. And the gun commander, who has suffered similarly to Shadow, agrees, kind of completing his arc and ending his hatred for Shadow. And as for Shadow himself, well, he's back to how he was at the end of SA2, right? He's regained his memory, and now he can go back to fulfilling Maria's wish of protecting the Earth. No, 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 no. That is not at all what the ending of this game is. For some reason, people talk like that. Like, they'll talk about in later Sonic games how Shadow is still trying to fulfill Maria's promise of looking after the Earth. And I have no idea how people are coming to this conclusion other than that they are completely ignoring what the ending of this game is. If we go back to the things that Shadow said when he was overcoming the paralysis, <laughs> In Sonic Adventure 2, one of his arcs is that he is uncertain whether or not he is the real Shadow, and he decides that he is going to be the Shadow that he remembers, the one that Maria believed in. Shadow here, similarly, does not remember who he is, and he's trying to figure that out. But this time, Shadow makes a different decision. Because when he learns the whole truth about his past, and how he was created, and why he was created, he hates his past, and he wants nothing to do with it. He wants to move on from it, and abandon his past. He literally says it himself, he is not fighting for anyone else, he is doing this of his own accord. And this is something that I criticize Sonic Adventure 2 for, that Shadow basically had no agency in that game, he would just do whatever Maria told him to do, and that is exactly what this game is addressing. Because the entire game is Shadow trying to figure out who he is, and throughout the game, we see possibilities of who he can become. But importantly, almost all of those possibilities are other people telling Shadow who he is. Remember in Sonic Adventure 2, that scene where Shadow is talking with Maria, saying he doesn't know what his purpose is. And then he was given this duty by Gerald to defeat the Black Arms. He never signed up for that, he was created to fulfill that purpose. Right from the very beginning, Shadow was being told who he is. And then while Maria is dying, she also tells Shadow who to be by giving her wish to him. And after Maria's death, Gerald alters his memories and once again tells Shadow who he is. He is a tool to fulfill Gerald's revenge. Now we get to Shadow the Hedgehog, and you go down many of these different paths, and what do we see? Black Doom telling Shadow that he is a pawn and that he is to serve him. Eggman telling Shadow that he is a Shadow Android. The Gun Commander telling Shadow that he is a monster that should not exist. Sonic and Friends TM telling him that he is a hero and that he should help them save the world. Everyone has always been telling Shadow who he is and what he should do. Shadow has never gotten the choice to choose for himself before, and in this moment he decides, I'm done with all of that. I'm not going to listen to what anyone tells me to do. I am going to determine my own destiny. I don't need to figure out my past. I don't need others to tell me who I am. I will decide for myself who Shadow the Hedgehog is. I pointed out that moment in Sonic Adventure 2 where Shadow declares, I am Shadow the Hedgehog, and that is him declaring that he is choosing to be the Shadow that he remembers and that Maria believed in. Well here, Shadow says the same thing, but with a different thing behind it. Shadow is not defeating Black Doom here because Gerald told him to. Shadow is defeating Black Doom here because he hates his past and he wants nothing to do with it anymore. He is doing this to bury the last remnants of the Shadow that existed 50 years ago. He wants to erase his past. He does not want the past deciding who he is. He wants to decide for himself. And so he has one final thing he needs to put to rest before he can truly move on from the shadow that existed 50 years ago. And this leads to what is actually my favorite super transformation sequence in the series thus far, cause listen to the music.
This is the last hurrah for the original Shadow, the one from SA2. Once Shadow defeats Black Doom and destroys the Black Comet, that's it. He has successfully erased his past. They never even really make it clear whether or not Shadow regains his memory. There's nothing in the last story to indicate that Shadow actually remembers what happened in SA2 and on the Ark 50 years ago. He just gets told what happens. Because Shadow does not regain his memory and go back to fulfilling Maria's promise, Shadow from Sonic Heroes onward is essentially a totally different character from Shadow in Sonic Adventure 2. And I actually really like this because I complained about how bringing Shadow back undermines his sacrifice from SA2. But we actually don't. The Shadow from SA2 is still dead. The Shadow that chose to believe in the memories he had and believe in Maria, he's still gone. We now have this new Shadow that wants nothing to do with any of that. And by eliminating the remnants of the old Shadow's existence, he has separated himself completely from the original Shadow. And somehow people completely miss this, and I really cannot see why. Because look at the ending of the game. Adios. Shadow the Hedgehog. Not only does he throw away a photo of Maria and Gerald, who were once the people that Shadow cared most about in the entire world, but what he says, Adios, Shadow the Hedgehog, that is something that people say to Shadow when they are never going to see him again. This is Shadow saying that he is a different person than the Shadow that used to exist, and the Shadow that used to exist is now truly gone. And I think this is an awesome story as a way to bring back Shadow. It respects the original intention of Shadow's character in SA2 and re-explores Shadow in an interesting new way that addresses one of the problems I think his character had before. Going forward now, Shadow is no longer tied to his past. He no longer has anything to do with Maria, what happened 50 years ago, any of that. From here on out, this Shadow is his own person, and he's going to do what he wants. So that is the story of Shadow the Hedgehog. This was by far the most difficult of these story videos to do so far, because I really wanted to get it right because of how often people misunderstand or seemingly ignore the story of this game and say that it's terrible. And while there are certainly many, many, many problems with the way the story is told, I think the ideas here are really, really cool, and I don't at all think that this game ruins Shadow's character. In fact, I think it enhances it and makes him even more interesting and layered. I honestly think this was like the best possible thing they could have done with Shadow's character, and I hope I've managed to convince you of the same. Before I go, one last thing I want to touch on is Probably the worst example of English dubbing I have ever seen in my entire life. Because at the end, Shadow says, Adios, Shadow the Hedgehog, and that's obviously a callback to Sonic Adventure 2. But in that game, in English, for the dub, they changed it to Sayonara, Shadow the Hedgehog. Which is fine, whatever, it gets the same idea across. But what matters is that when they were translating Shadow the Hedgehog in English, Whoever was doing the initial translation knew that this was a callback, and so he wanted to make it consistent with what they did in the previous English dub. So in their translation, they wrote, Sayonara Shadow the Hedgehog. And then I can only assume that whoever was doing the next pass of the translation, or editing it, or whatever, they saw Sayonara written there and was like, Oh, they forgot to translate that. Let me fix that. And so for the ending of the game, what is supposed to be a nice callback to Sonic Adventure 2, is instead this. Goodbye forever, Shadow the Hedgehog. Call me a weeaboo all you want for going with the Japanese versions of all these games, but at least the fucking story is told correctly this way, Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, I'll see you next time.